Hey folks, welcome back to Patriot to the Coral Podcast. I'm Thad Forrester. I really appreciate you joining me again this week with my guest, Dan Schilling. Uh, I told you in my last episode the problems I was having with my podcast, with it coming up in uh, iTunes as no name or no title. You can't even search for Patriot to the Core in, pot, in iTunes. I, I don't know why. But trying to get that fixed, maybe by the time this one gets released, that it will be resolved. But my hopes were the last one, it would resolve it with the last one with Justin Carroll, and it still hadn't been. So never fear, if you're listening to this, you are probably subscribed or you went, you just clicked directly to it. So thank you for finding my podcast. Uh, in the pre-dawn hours of March 4th, 2002, just below the 10,000-foot peak of a mountain in eastern Afghanistan, a fierce battle raged, outnumbered by al-Qaeda fighters, Air Force Combat Controller John Chapman and a handful of SEALs struggled to take the summit in a desperate bid to find a lost teammate. Chapman, leading the charge, was gravely wounded in the initial assault, and believing he was dead, the SEAL leader ordered a retreat. Then uh, Chapman regained his consciousness, finding himself alone with the enemy who was closing in on three sides. Thus began the most difficult and exceptional fight of his life. If you haven't seen the drone footage of his fight, I encourage you to watch that there's a link to it in the show notes. Um, on, on August 22nd, 2018, President Trump posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor to John Chapman. And my guest today, Mr. Dan Schilling, has written a book called Alone at Dawn to capture the life and legacy of this American hero. And although the book doesn't come out until June, I loved getting an inside scoop on Chapman's life and leading up to his final mission and how Dan became involved. Um, we also talk about Dan's extreme sports and why he set a Guinness World Record for 201 base jumps in 24 hours. I love watching Dan's videos on Facebook of his jump base jumps. He, he lives out in the mountains of Utah and just beautiful scenery. And it just makes me jealous at what he does because I want to go out there and join him. So uh, let's get in and talk to Dan. All right. So Dan Schilling, you are writing a book about John Chapman called Alone at Dawn. Tell me how you got involved with this book in the first place. The so story. I, it's, when you see this book, and you should buy many copies of this book, and anyone listening should buy many copies of this book, uh, the first thing I mentioned in my acknowledgments is I did not want to write this book. I had retired in September of 2016 after 31 years in the military, most of that as a combat controller or a special tactics officer, um, but I also spent – half a dozen years in Army Special Forces, and I started as an infantry grunt. Most people don't know. I was in 11 Bravo. Huh. Yeah, I, I started as an enlisted guy in, in the Army. And I, then I was ready to hang out with my wife, write novels, ski, speed fly, base jump, mountain climb, roughly in that order, because I definitely wanted to spend time with my wife most of all. Another combat controller I knew who was doing some work in Australia hit me up. He's like, hey, I want to talk to you about doing some work down under and yeah i said come on out and visit me and he said well, what do you do with your time i said oh, i write books this is all i do now and he said oh john chapman's sister Lori longfritz was trying to write a book and man you should help her and you could write a book with her and i said there is no way that i want to write a book about the military i had just finished 31 years i was ready for something else i loved my job and uh and i was very honored to have been a combat controller in a stow and have served you know around the world but i was ready for something else and but I agreed to help Lori with shaping a proposal, and I put her in touch with my my literary agent. Man, two weeks went by, and I could not sleep at night. I just this thing was haunting me, and I realized I had to write this book because I was in a position to tell the story as it should be told. Both John's story, because I knew most of the guys involved, the Delta Force commander some of the SEALs, all the combat controllers. I mean, these are people I knew personally. And who better to tell a combat control's story? Because for me, this book is, it's about John Chapman, this remarkably generous, empathetic, and selfless man, both on and off the battlefield. But it's about combat control, because combat control is the least known special operations force in the United States inventory. And that's ironic because combat controllers are the deadliest individuals to ever walk a human battlefield in the history of warfare. No one controls more precision air power and therefore control over life and death on a battlefield than a combat controller. 
Why ever. is that? Because combat controllers have the basic skill sets that are requisite to being a ranger, a green beret, or a seal. You shoot, move, communicate, dive, you know, infiltrate with parachutes, whatever. Those things are 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 a skill set that is common to all of them. They're they're challenging and all of those communities have very high standards for entry as does combat control. But combat control differentiates itself from all others in this respect. Combat controllers think four dimensionally. They think three dimensional space and time on top of that everywhere they go. So if I'm on a battlefield with some SEALs from SEAL Team Six, and I've been on battlefields, those guys, and I am looking from point A to point B, let's just say there's a hill three kilometers away, the SEAL or the Green Beret standing to my left and right are thinking about how to get there, the terrain masking, what's that look like? That combat controller is thinking about air power that he may or may not have yet or that he would need to wield, how it can be applied, the, the, the huge differentiation between rotary wing assets, uh, fighter assets, and you know strategic bombers, what those payloads are, what the call signs are, what frequencies they're on, where they're going to be stacked if I get a whole bunch at one time. I mean, you have to be this remarkably intellectual and visual human. And other forces can call in airstrikes in extremists, and they have done it well time and again. But there is no one on the planet that can orchestrate air power the way a combat controller can. One of my friends on the show, Kyle D4, and he was a he was a SEAL, and he was a, a Team 6 guy, a dev crew guy, mm-hmm. and uh, even though he won't ever come right out and say it, not not at least you know in, in public, but he he had told me too, he's like, man, you can't have a good fight without a combat controller. Got to have them. It's, it, Got to have them. And, and it's, it's finally come into its own. I mean, it was created in 1953. Uh, that was the creation of combat control. Now, let's not bog down on that. But for the first 30 years, going into the 80s, it was sort of a backwater, even esoteric kind of a expertise. And what has changed is the fact that the war that's ongoing this evening you know, when it finishes one spot, we take it on the road, and it's been going since September of 2001. The expertise of combat control has revealed itself and manifested itself on these battlefields across the world for the last 15 years, really. And there aren't enough combat controllers to go around. Everybody has realized, everybody being defined as the Army and Navy counterparts that we support, uh, There aren't enough of these guys. So the Air Force uh, has directed recruiting and public affairs across the entire United States Air Force to focus on one primary goal, recruit combat controllers, because we do not have enough. And that's an amazing thing. Now, we're still a fraction of the size. I mean, there's thousands of SEALs and thousands of Green Berets, but there's only 600 combat controllers. And that's Mm -hmm. double the number that was um, our composite force for all, most of my career. We were always about 300 guys at any one time. Yeah, small community. Yeah, and everybody knows everybody else. It's, you know, one degree of separation. If you don't know the guy, you know a guy who knows the guy. Right, right. You know, you know everybody does. So and if you're like me, I always tell people, well, I was only in for 31 years, but I really spanned four decades. Came in the 80s. Hit my stride in the 90s. In the aughts, I was involved in well, there were some special projects and doing things and became a squadron commander, and then I didn't wrap up until the teens. And that's four decades of spectrum. You know, the guys who raised me were guys who were doing stuff and legally or illegally, depending on how you define that, in Laos and Cambodia in the Vietnam during the, the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Those are the guys I grew up under, the guys from Desert One and, and the earlier war. Uh, well, and you, you know, you were part of uh, the Black Hawk Down era. I guess that was that Operation Gothic Serpent. That was the name of the deployment. It was always Operation Gothic Serpent until Mark Bowden wrote his book, which was a seminal book. I mean, it that book put special operations on the map in a way it didn't really enjoy since the Vietnam War. And then Jerry Bruckheimer made a movie, which wasn't a bad movie. You know, um, it's pretty realistic. 
and it didn't fall into the normal traps, one of two traps that you get from a Hollywood movie. So I'm grateful for that. Um, but uh, it, that helped change things for the American psyche. And uh, what I am attempting to do now with the book that I spent two years researching and writing is to bring combat control the same positive exposure and there's good and bad that comes along with that, that SEALs and Green Berets and Rangers enjoy. Because our guys have earned it. Your brother is a prime example of why I committed myself to doing this, even though I didn't want to write this kind of book. Because look what he did on the battlefield. I mean, you know his story in greater detail than I ever will. But, I mean, he sacrificed himself, not and willingly put himself at risk, not just for his Green Beret counterparts, but for the Afghans he was fighting alongside. Mm -hmm. Let, let's get back to, to Chapman in the book, because I was at a combat controller reunion a few years ago, and they announced that Chapman's family wanted to put together some kind of book. I don't know if they're looking for a biography or just some type of um, facts or something, a remembrance book, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking it must have been this. Is that is that about when this happened? You said you've been working on it two years, and I'm guessing it was about three years when I was down there last. Well, so, yeah, it's going on three years, eternity. So, yeah, actually, that brings us back to the story. So I, I actually called Lori, John's sister, back and said, hey, listen, I, I, I'm going to help you write this book. And, uh, and, and by that, I mean I'm going to really – I'll end up driving this train. Kyle Stambro, the guy who introduced the two of us, warned her in advance that, oh, if Dan comes on board, you'll get a book because she's been trying to work this for many years. But you have – but you're going to lose control and, you know, he's just going to, he's just going to Dano it. And so, and that's what happened. Um, and, uh, and she came along on board. It's been a great experience. Uh, we both have the same goals, but what I told her was, listen, I'm not going to write a book about John. You know, she was there to, she provided a life background and John's background and, and, and stuff related to Valerie, John's widow and the girls and, this sort of stuff, and most of it really fell to me. And I said, I'm not going to write a book about John. I'm going to write a book about John and combat control because your brother, A, would not want to have a book just about himself in the first place. And B, this is our opportunity through John's loss to bring combat control to the American public in a way it's never been done. We're going to, it's going to be a big book. It's going to be a, a bestseller. I, not because I'm a great writer, because it's a really compelling story, and this is really compelling history about combat control. And now we've got a movie. And yeah. so I call, called her back and said, this is what we're going to do, and I'll guarantee you we'll have a book deal in six months. And we did. And uh, spent the last you – know, this was September of 16, so it's been two and a half years, I guess, something. That's great. Uh, what can you tell us about – specifically about – because I want to learn about John, but specifically at this point, March 4th, 2002. Uh, well, you know, we don't really have time to get all the background, but, but it came down to there were Delta Force was running advanced force operations, which is in layman's terms, they were sneaking behind enemy lines in preparation to support Operation Anaconda, which was America's first major campaign and the and enduring freedom, and uh, so in Afghanistan, and it was a hammer and anvil thing. They were going to force the Taliban and the and and the rest of the Uzbeks and Chechens and everyone else who was there to get it on against the mountains, and then they would drop a hammer on them with an anvil against that. The mountains would be the backdrop would be the anvil, and a great leader from Delta Force, a guy I really respect, and a friend of mine, Pete Blaber, was running these operations. And they had some SEALs from Dev Group, and there were some guys from Delta, but they had combat controllers with them. For many reasons, and we'll, we'll skip this part for our purposes here, but um, they, a very late entry into putting guys behind the lines was going to be a, a, a team called Call Sign Mako 3-0 which was run by a uh, steel named Slab, and the combat controller was John Chapman. <clears throat> and through a series of poor decisions, no fault of the team guys, um, and uh, battlefield tyranny, 
uh, they ended up on top of this mountain. And uh, one of the seals was they were trying to insert on top of the mountain, fell out of the back. He wasn't snapped in. Uh, they took two RPGs to this MH-47 helicopter. A guy named Earl Roberts fell out of the back, and uh, the helicopter crashed down the valley in controlled crash. <clears throat> and the remaining SEALs and John Chapman elected to go back and try and rescue Neil Roberts. And that's what took John to the summit of that mountain. <clears throat> What's significant about their return to the summit of this mountain in the wee hours, about 5 o'clock in the morning. Actually, they landed at 457. So before, about an hour before real sunlight, uh, was they knew they were going straight back to the same spot that the enemy knew they'd be coming straight back to because the enemy had captured and then executed Neil Roberts about 30 minutes before the guys came back to the summit. So when John Chapman and the SEALs elected to go back up there, they were going into a gunfight. They knew they were outgunned, outnumbered, and the enemy was just waiting for them to return. And that's exactly what they stepped into. And for John Chapman to come off that helicopter, and uh, he was the second guy off. <clears throat> the team leader, a guy named Slab, was the first guy off, but he fell in the snow, knee and thigh deep snow. These guys are 10,000 feet, mind you. In fact, it's 10,500 almost. Uh, the, the summit of this mountain, and they're right there at the summit. He fell in the snow, and John leaped over him and kept going, and the other SEALs came out. And by the time the other SEALs had all sort of um, taken a knee and decided, were deciding which way to go, John was already charging into the most immediate threat, which was a uh, enemy bunker, fortified. They'd been dug in, had it prepped for weeks, waiting for Operation Anaconda to go down. And he charged upslope at 10,000 feet in knee-deep snow and basically charged right into this bunker and killed two guys at point-blank range. I mean, like, could have hit him with his gun if he decided not to shoot him. It was a remarkable feat of bravery. So I he, mean, just, it's just, he snuck up on him, or he was just he moved so fast? No, it was that they were shooting at him, and he was shooting at them. And he ran right up into the bunker and killed both these guys. How they missed him... Uh, it boggles the mind, but in my experience with gunfights, there can be 10 guys in a phone booth all shooting guns at each other, and six of those 10 guys are going to miss in a gunfight, and the bullets just go wherever. It's just the way gunfights unfold, and you just can't predict them. But so John saved the lives. This is what was amazing. The SEALs, to a man at that time, uh, testified that John is the reason they all survived. And that was the basis for John's original Air Force Cross that was awarded in 2002. Um, so, but October, so, uh, you know, much later in the year, this John died on, on March 4th, uh, he received this Air Force Cross, uh, which is second only to the Medal of Honor, as you know. Um, but so the, the SEALs, there's five SEALs and John on the mountain, and the the SEAL team leader, Slab, eventually caught up with John in the bunker that John cleared single-handedly, and John was engaging the second bunker, which has unimaginably been named Bunker Number 2. And so Slab joined him, and both of them were engaging that bunker. Two SEALs flanked to the left uh, in proximity to them, and some other the other two guys remained down slow. Well, during this part of the engagement, <clears throat> John got shot, uh, I believe, twice. Uh, based on a number of things I won't bog down on, but the forensics uh, from the pathology indicate that's what happened originally. And the SEALs were getting, that was an onslaught. I mean, there's two dozen hardened Uzbek and Chechen fighters on top of this mountain, and there's now six guys. And John gets shot, now there's, there's five guys, and Slab makes the decision to tactically uh, retreat. But uh, And he thought John was dead because he saw John get shot, and John actually cried out when he was shot. Uh, he, I, what he said was, where did that come from, or what was that? There's variations of those two phrases that came out of him. But the SEALs never checked John physically, um, so no one's faulting Slab for making his decision. He thought he was dead, but because they didn't check him uh, and then retreated, they also never recovered Roberts. They never saw Roberts, and they actually stumbled right over Roberts' body. You can't fault them for that either because this was a really intense gunfight. I mean, you're, you are fighting for your life. 
but they made the decision, fateful as it may have been, to retreat. And sometime after they so Dan, had did left they leave the summer, Robert's body there as well. Yes, yeah. Okay. They never they and none of their after action reports, and I have all of them. Do they mention encountering or discussing Roberts's disposition or whereabouts? So they never saw Roberts, and they literally stumbled over him. That's one of the I have come to believe through my exhaustive investigation and research that the body that the seals think was John was actually Neil Roberts because he was still warm. He'd only been dead 30 minutes. And uh, at any rate, when they left, um, John actually recovered, whether he lost consciousness or was just incapacitated will never be known. But what is known is John, John resurrected himself and then fought for another hour against these hard Uzbeks and Chechens on top of the mountain. Um, ultimately getting shot or receiving 16 penetrating wounds. So he got shot uh, nine times, and then he had other either fragments or other bullet parts in his body, 16 wounds, in addition to contusions on his hand, face, neck, and, and head uh, from hand-to-hand combat. All of these were anti-mortem. These, all of these things happened to him before he died. And uh, we know that because we have the pathology. So for an hour, John fought up there on top of this mountain by himself. And it, it, well, what it really comes down to, here's where it gets really remarkable, if that's not remarkable enough. In the course of this, having fended off three assaults, hand-to-hand combat distances where he killed guys, you know, either by shooting them right up on top of them or knocking them out with his weapon and then killing them, I don't know. And we'll never know, but he did kill every assailant who attacked him inside this bunker. Uh, an hour and a couple minutes into this one-man stand, and remember now, John was mortally wounded. He had been shot in the gut, and he was going to die anyway. But he's up there in shock, having received upwards of a dozen gunshot wounds. And he hears in the distance a, another MH-47 flying up towards the mountain. Only one spot it would be going, and he, John would have known that this was a search and rescue helicopter, which is what it was. And it's coming to the top of the mountain. Now, if you're John Chapman, you're faced with a decision. You're in this bunker, and you're holding your own, and you've been doing it for an hour. And these guys are, are probably your salvation. So you can stay in that bunker, lone as you are, frozen in shock, in you know, freezing temperatures, so your body is really shutting down, and you're dying. You probably didn't know he was dying, but he was dying. And you can wait and hope that you know, these guys are going to get to you. Or this will be the third helicopter to land on this spot. And if I don't get out of this bunker and take the fight to the enemy who was trying to displace him with RPGs, they had a heavy machine gun, a dish gun on top of the mountain that they wanted to displace and put into John's bunker, which would give him a clear shot at the helicopter landing zone. If you stay where you are, that helicopter is probably going to get shot down and the 18 guys, as it turns out, were on this helicopter. You're assigning them to death. So you're faced with this choice. John was unbelievable to me still to this day, and I can get choked up about it. It was a very hard thing for me to write the week that I spent writing just this part of the book. This guy, who was all alone, was left for dead, has been shot up, climbed out of a bunker, and you can see him on the video moving in three different directions, engaging the enemy to protect that helicopter. And he literally fought till he ran out of ammunition. And uh, the rounds that killed him came in from the back. They shot him from above. I think he was facing down slope at the time. And that that his it blew up his aorta and he, his blood pressure dropped to zero and he expired. But he clearly made this decision to do, to take this course of action. It's amazing to me that this guy could do that after everything he'd already been through. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Wow, and that gives me chills. Do you know, uh, yeah, did he have a blade? Did he use a blade on any of them up close? Or did no, he he, no, he did not. And um, uh, he had a Rhodesian vest, and um, they had stripped down from the original mission was to be a reconnaissance and call in airstrikes, which John would have done from the top of the mountain. 
to a rescue mission. So they stripped down into just bullets and small radios, and um, John did not – he didn't have a pistol either. Okay. So he shot every – all the rounds he had, with the exception of one of his magazines on his Rhodesian vest, is a you know chest-mounted vest. It's very similar to what the guys wear now, but not nearly as good as what the guys have on the battlefield, including your brother. But um, uh, he shot all his magazines except for one because one of those took a round through it and, and destroyed the magazine yeah. when we recovered all his kit. Yeah, it's it's remarkable, and this guy. To, to do that for another 18 men that he didn't know, it was just, it's, it, it boggles my mind to this day. I, I struggle with the words, and I spent two years writing this book. You know, I, I'm, you've been in firefights. You know, I haven't. I have no clue what it's like. I'm just kind of guessing that if you know, he's got his training. You, well, you just elaborate on, on what I'm about to say, but or correct me, but you got your training that kicks in. But I'm, I'm guessing also he was just ticked. He was mad. I don't know, but what, what well, do you think? What goes through your head? In those I, well, so one of the things in writing a book of this nature is you have to be careful that you differentiate what he decided to do versus what he thought. Because I have no idea what he thought, right? I mean, I would believe that he went through the spectrum of emotions, both you know, forsaken and alone and afraid and scared and angry and frustrated and hopeful when you hear these helicopter coming up. But he made at least 15 calls out going on his radio because another combat controller three kilometers away on top of another hilltop, uh, Jay Hill, who was with three Delta Force guys, heard John. And Jay was a 2-4 member. He knew John well. He knew John's the sound of John's voice, John's call sign, his radio etiquette. He's one of the guys that I spent a lot of time interviewing because he's the only individual that heard John call out from the mountain after the SEALs had retreated and left him behind. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's... And, Going back to what John thought, I, I don't know, but he clearly was trying to affect things in a positive way, and he clearly made some decisions. When he came off the helicopter, he charged right into that bunker and cleared it. Yeah, He decided to do that in, in the head of the SEALs. This, none of the SEALs caught up to this. The SEAL team leader almost caught him on one occasion, and then John charges ahead straight uphill in the snow at 10,000 feet. So he decided to do that. He clearly was hunkered down in this bunker and been, had been defending it for over an hour. He clearly decided he had to get out of the bunker when that helicopter was short final, you know, a couple minutes out, to protect that helicopter. That was a very, very clear thing. So his, he thought about it, but I, I can't really say what he thought or felt. And um, I think you'll find that to segue to the movie, you know, that's what, that's what a Hollywood movie will do. The, that's a because the movie is a dramatization. You know, mm -hmm. the book I've written is a historical document. It uses research interviews, you know, and then my own expertise to patch things together from all the things that I've done for my 30 year career. But a movie is a movie. It's a dramatization. And what's great about this movie, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the, the individuals that we're working with in Hollywood and um, and pleased with the direction they're heading because to them, this is, again, an, un, an untold story. There are there's so many SEAL and Green Beret movies, and there has never been a movie that's about the Air Force and combat control, and this movie is all about John. So you get some dramatization there. Um, hopefully it's good. I don't have any real control over Hollywood. As right, right. Not a surprising revelation. <laughs> well, Dan, what took so long for that footage to be released? I, I think it was from a drone, right? Why did it yeah, take so it was long? a... Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut yeah, you why off. Why did it take so long to release that? Well, the, the footage wasn't really part of anything for years. Um, you know, the footage... John's Air Force Cross that he was awarded in 2002 was based on three documents. Those three documents were nothing but the witness statements from three SEALs on his team who all said, John saved our lives. Uh, one of the quotes is, we should get him the highest medal we could possibly get for him. 
and we'd be dead without John. No, they didn't talk to the other combat controllers that were out there, no one from Delta Force, not Pete Labor, the commander on the scene. There was no video footage, nothing was used, just those three documents. So in the Air Force in 2015, at the direction of the Secretary of the Air Force, Debbie James, who said, we might be missing something here. Let's go back and investigate some of these incidences to make sure we have given our airmen the appropriate medal. And if we haven't, we need to rectify that. So this is now 13 years after John has passed away and, and his heroics have gone into history already as an Air Force Cross recipient. The, the video footage came to light, and it's a, it's a sort of a hidden tale. And I, I, I'm not going to share it all, but the fact is that the CIA Predator drone footage finally came into the possession of the Air Force for use uh, years later. But that was just the start of it, because then you start to dig into it and peel this back, which is what the Air Force did very diligently. There was a, a wonderful special tactics officer named Mike Wendelkin who committed two plus years of his life to doing nothing but chronicling John's hour and few minutes on the mountain. Didn't care what happened before that. Didn't care about anything after. It was what did John do? And <clears throat> when you start to get into this stuff, and you know, Jay Hill for the first time was it was 14 years after the fact that he finally gave a witness statement because he didn't know he needed to give one. The war was ongoing. You know, it didn't stop because John died and, and seven, six other guys died on this mountain. The missions were ongoing. The Jay Hill was out there for another five days, killing Uzbeks, Chechens, and Taliban. So he gives his testimony, which is, well, you know, I heard John calling out, uh, and it was he did it for an hour, and I kept responding to him, but he never responded back. Now, we don't know if John heard him and his radio wasn't working or it was just shot through or he never heard Jay, but what is definitive is John Chapman kept calling out and Jay Hill kept hearing him, which answered one of the questions, well, because there was some contention about whether he was still dead. There were certain parties that said, oh, he was definitely dead when the SEALs retreated. Well, we know for a fact he wasn't because he was calling out on the radio, in addition to everything else that we know. And uh, so that's what sort of put this ball rolling forward, and then you come to realize, man, there was so much more to John's story and his actions, and that investigation took two plus years. Well, what happened to the SEAL commander? Is that Slab or Slab? What is, what is his name? Well, Slab, Bert Slavinsky was the team leader uh, of the SEALs with John Chapman that were going in to take her gar, the name of the mountain. Uh, so he's he wasn't an officer. He was a, a senior NCO. Uh, he was a senior chief. Um, the the commanders were the leaders of SEAL Team Six. Okay, I'm I'm wondering, and I'm not trying to be an armchair quarterback here, but the whoever made the decision to leave, you know, what, what what's happened to him or the or the those? You mean to to leave to leave John behind? Correct. So Britt Slavinsky was awarded the Medal of Honor this year. Okay. And there's a there's, there's a lot controversy of controversy over that. Right. There's a lot of controversy over that. For the book, I, for the most part, go move past that. And here's why: I'm not interested in politics of certain SEAL Team Six leaders who have a position on this matter, who are, are wrong. I would also add, because I've written a book to honor John Chapman and all the combat controllers who have gone unrecognized and to establish a legacy for combat control. So I don't care about politics. I care about combat control. And my narrative is about those two things, John Chapman and combat control. And I hope people are reading my book 20 years from now. Um, so 20 years from now, who gives a shit what happened to some politics and uh, you know other medals of honor, whatever. None of that stuff matters to me. What matters is John's legacy is assured, and through John, I believe I can play a small part in ensuring that guys like your brother and the guys that are out there this evening and the other 13 guys who have died since the war started in combat, in addition to your brother, are, are given the recognition they deserve because they are the deadliest men to ever walk a battlefield in the history of warfare. That deserves recognition. 
What else about John would you like to say? John here in part from one. A, <laughs> from a, from a from an early age in kindergarten. This is this is wonderful anecdote in the book that uh, Laurie ferreted out. First day of kindergarten, little kid named Billy Brooks, new kid in town, new kid at school, and he was getting bullied basically. And John, as a kindergartner, basically stepped between him and his tormentor and said, hold on here. You know, everybody calm down. We're not picking on this kid. And he, he had always done that. There's a, throughout his life, there's story after story in the book, but one of the things I'll, I'll use to sort of uh, punctuate this for you or listeners is in Afghanistan, there, John is, with the same SEALs from SEAL Team 6 and another comic controller named Andy Martin. And they're put up by this Afghan family in a house during a snowstorm that they're waiting for it to pass and continue on with their mission. And inside this home, this Afghan mother puts her baby daughter in John's lap because he just had that effect on people. He had two girls of his own. They were they're five and, and three at the time. Um, now, I don't know how many Afghan villages you've hung out in, but for an Afghan mother to give her baby over to a strange white guy just doesn't happen in <laughs> Afghanistan. But he had that effect on people, and you can see it in his eyes. I wanted this for the cover of the book. We ultimately went with something different mm -hmm. because it's so revealing. You know, there's lots of pictures of special ops guys with guns and, you know, and suppressors and PEC ones, lasers, whatever. But to, to show this side of John, who no doubt heroically gave his life to save many, but the human he was was not about those things or even the military at all. He yes. was first and foremost a human, and that's how he viewed the world. People needed protecting, and uh, it's a remarkable photo. You've probably seen it. If you Google oh, John absolutely. Chapman, yeah, everybody's seen that picture. It's iconic. And... Uh, that, to me, you can see it in his eyes. He was a kind man. Yeah. I, I, that is great background. I didn't know the history of that picture. I just knew it is very well known. And, you know, what you said about, yeah, he was, he was, there was another side to him. He wasn't just this, just this warrior with a weapon all the time. And that's one thing my wife always says with, with pictures of Mark. Because there's always, people are always wanting pictures for something, right? They're, they're, they're doing some type right. of fundraiser right. or whatever it is and my wife's always like that's just not the mark i know I, I know the mark that's just you know he's the uncle and he's my brother-in-law and he's just a good-looking guy not with all the military garb on that's right and and that's me and but you come to people view you in a certain light uh based on on specific snapshots of what you might have been doing, but it doesn't define who you are. You know, one of the things that happened to me in the course of my career was, you know, Black Hawk Down, those of us who were part of that mission, especially in the Army, uh, Army being Delta Force, uh, but some of the Rangers too, enjoyed this halo effect throughout your career because you were part of this mission. And one of the things I wanted to do to redefine myself later on, this is why I went off and set a world record for base jumping, is I really didn't want to be known for the rest of my life as Black Hawk Down Dan. I mean, there's to me, uh, like if you talk to my wife, I'm the stay-at-home sort of dorky guy who, like, you know, likes writing books. No adrenaline involved in writing books, I can assure you. And, uh, you know, I, I'm... I'm a stay at home kind of dude or I ski around the mountain by myself or go fly by myself. And that was a way to raise money for the special operations warrior foundation for people who've lost, you know, kids who've lost a parent in special ops and do something that was a bit different. And, uh, so it's a, it's one of those things you have to guard against. I think personally. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. I'd love to let, let's let everybody learn about you too, because yeah, you talked about your world record for the, for yeah. the number of base jumps, I think in a, I think there's base jumps, right? In a, in a 24 hour mm -hmm. period. And so yeah. Explain that and, and the purpose of that with a, with a. Well, I, yeah, like a lot of guys who come from either combat or have PTSD for whatever reason, um, a lot of people use different coping mechanisms. Some people crawl in a bottle. Some people 
you know, that just have rage issues or whatever. For me, one of the ways I channel that is I like to focus on things that were really, really hard to do that had pretty significant consequences. You know, base jumping is one of those sports. It's the only thing I've ever done in my life that you have to do everything right at exactly the right time, every time you do it, or you're going to die. And so there's a lot of appeal t- to me for that, but there's a lot of purity involved and peace involved in base jumping. It's different than skydiving. You're in a plane, loud noises, people running around, you know, everyone's excited. Base jumping is a really introspective type of activity, but it has these other draws. So I got really into base jumping for years. I mean, I base jumped every week and I had a cliff in my backyard and it was great. But I realized what I could do is combine my passion for a couple of things. I liked supporting the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, and I really liked base jumping. And I thought, you know, if I can put these two together, we c- I can get a lot of press and we can raise a lot of money for the Warrior Foundation, and hopefully it'll be a good time. And so this is 2006. It's quite some time ago. We went up to spend a year planning this thing, like most things that there's a lot that goes into something like this. And uh, you know, I had like I had two dozen parachutes and 15 parachute packers and a 60 ton construction crane and, you know, million dollar insurance policy and all this stuff. And we went up and I did 201 base jumps in 22 hours. And our, my goal was to do 200. And so I did 200 and then I had to do one more for teamwork because you've seen this enough around combat control. You always got to do one more for teamwork. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, Yep, it's just like memorial push-ups, right? We <laughs> allow you to do one for teamwork. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's what we did. And it was a great experience. It was very positive, and it allowed me to sort of add a dimension to my life. I thought that uh, people would see me differently than they had seen me before. And now I write books because I, I enjoy stories. I, think, I believe in the power of stories. Uh, you know, it's similar to what you're doing. You are doing this thing in honor of your brother, but you're really just telling stories with people. I love it. I love asking questions and finding out about people and hearing these remarkable stories like this. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I I love stories. Listen, I, you know, I didn't want to write this book, but I'm so glad I did. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to responses from people. You know, I'll get criticism. I'm not really looking forward to that. That's why I'm going to write, you know, military nonfiction. I couldn't really write about my career. You know, like so much of our careers, guys who do what we do are, are classified. And uh, so the really interesting things you can't even write about. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't want to do that. I just like writing fiction. You know what? Did you ever see that movie, Along Came Polly? So it's Ben Stiller. He is uh, he, he's trying to get this client who is a guy like you. He's needing a, a huge insurance policy, but he lives a very dangerous life, base jumping and all this stuff that you do. So anyway, when you started talking about that, I was like, man, this is Along Came Polly right here. Funny movie. I, I've never, I've never seen that. But I'll tell you what, I, um, I've learned a lot more. I've learned to respect movies and Hollywood in a way that I never did before. And uh, I'll, I'm a, I'll check it out. Yeah. Well, well, Dan, tell us how to find you and how people can pre-order the book. So it, the best thing to do, and listen, uh, to be very upfront, it is my intention to make this book a national bestseller, and I intend to do that before the book is even released. So to answer your question, the book's going to be uh, in bookstores on shelves on June 25th. However, you can pre-order. Uh, the best place to do that, it's, it's a two-step process, and I guess really, I now have a web page. In my life, I never thought I would have a web page or a Facebook page. I never had either of those till after I retired. And uh, but 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 I have a um, I've got a, a web page which is danshillingbooks.com. So it's all one word, uh, and it's it's D A N, and my last name is S C H I L L I N G, books.com. And if you go there. Uh, you'll you'll see there's right up on the front page because the book's my web page is all about John. Uh, you know, Alone at Dawn populates. You'll see it at the top. Um, and right down below there, you'll see buy the book. And uh, you can do the hard book or the e-book. And um, they're printing a lot of books. The publisher is really behind us, uh, both Lori and I. And they expect the book to do really well. And I do too. People need to, people want this story. And the Air Force wants this story. Yes. The Air Force is embracing its heroes 
not pilot heroes in a way that they have never done before. And it's another thing that's really heartening to me as a guy who spent 30 years in obscurity as a combat controller when no one knew who we are. I used to tell people I was an air traffic controller. What do you do? Um, air traffic controller. Because people would believe that. Yeah. If you tell them you're a combat controller, you do all this stuff, people would go, oh, the Air Force doesn't do that. You must be lying. Well, okay. If you say so, you know, I guess you know. So um, it's a great thing to see. That's the, that's the, that's where I would ask people to go, and we're hoping that uh, to sell 10,000 copies of the book before the book even comes out because that will make us a, a bestseller, and that's our goal. Our goal is to reach as many Americans as we can. Well, I'll do my part here. I'll have the, the beauty of the podcast, Dan, is I can have links. I'll have links to your website. Now, what about the Amazon pre-order? Do you want them to go there, or is it better to go to your website right now? No, go to, go to the website if, if you would. I mean, you can okay. get it through any retailer you want. Um, you know, Am- Amazon is fine. I'm a big fan of independent bookstores because I'm into books, man. I like books and stories. Yeah. But uh, uh, so for us um, – if people would just go, they, it's a, it's a one click. If you go to my page, you'll see the hardcover thing. You'll see it right there. It'll it'll go straight to uh, uh, Hachette, which is uh, our publisher, is Grand Central, and you can just you can buy it right there under the hardcover, and it'll it'll you know Beautiful. put you right to yeah. it. I'll be doing that, and um and I, and I know that pre-orders are crucial. Yeah, you want that you want that bestseller, so. That's exactly what we want. Listeners, go ahead and do it. Get it, order it now. And, and man, I, I appreciate anything that uh, you can do to help do that. Again, it's not for me. Uh, this is for John, uh, your brother in combat control. That's why I'm never shy. I, I meet with senior leaders of the Air Force and I tell them, you know what I want you to do? I want you to help me sell 500,000 copies of this book to every airman in the military, every airman in the Air Force. Because there's 500,000 folks in uniform in one capacity or another. And, uh, you know, if anyone can appreciate this book, it's the Air Force, because the Air Force is relegated to, in many times in the public eye, second-class citizenship. You know, it's not, people think Green Berets and SEALs, and hey, guess what? The deadliest man to ever walk any battlefield in the history of human civilization is an Air Force guy. <laughs> so we're hoping that'll sell more books, and uh, and if we can reach more people, more people will understand the sacrifices of guys like Mark and John. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have done an excellent, excellent job of really, uh, and kind of teasing us, you know, because there's so much more to John and to this story, and actually a lot more to you that I'd like to talk about another time. I mean, I'd love to do an in-person interview with you. Yeah. Um, well, we, we can do that sometime. I'd be happy to do it. You know, we're I'm in Utah, you know, for a guy whose brother did an LDS mission in Oakland, which is, uh, I mean, talk about, you know, <laughs> taking some risk. Some white kid from Alabama in Oakland as a missionary is uh, daunting. But, uh, it, you know, it's just different. It's a different world than the world he came from. One's not better or worse, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, it's hard to cross boundaries like that. But, you know, I live in Utah, so come on out. Love to have well- you. You know what's funny is my wife graduated high school from Park City, Utah. Well, see, I went to Davis High in Farmington, and my wife really? is from yeah, my wife's from Holiday. We're we're Utahs, man. This is why we came half back here to retire because okay. this is where we belong. Oh, I didn't I didn't know you were native there. I just thought you just went there because you needed the extreme sports, the outdoors. No, no, I I do it because it's it's quiet and uh, it's you know. Well, for many reasons, but uh, so we'd love to do that. Come on out, and uh, yeah, yeah. it would be it would be great. Yeah, her her parents now live up in in the Logan area. Yeah, I, I filled out a Utah State one time <laughs> <laughs> she before I joined too. the military. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, a lot of us go to Utah State to fail out. It's not an uncommon occurrence, man. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so, well, Dan, well, what about uh, hey? If we can ever get a joint book signing together, I have I have great plans of that too. Great hopes, yep. I guess, of that. So if you can work that out with the publisher, I know my publisher is on board. So maybe we can make it happen if you can. Well, wherever we yeah, can. and actually, so you know something we could uh, just to file away in the back of your mind, Dad, and I'd be only too happy to do this. Is uh, so book comes out in June. You know, there's a couple places I'll go on book tour. I, I'm I'm pretty certain. I'll go to Fort Walton Beach. I'll go to Fort Bragg. I'll probably go to, to Washington, D.C. But here in Utah, like, I'm a hometown guy. Like, I've done, you know, television shows here and the History Channel and whatever. I've done all that stuff out of Utah, and uh, including Park City TV. But uh, 
uh, you know, I'll be doing book tour stuff here. So if you were interested in doing something in the summertime out this way, we could probably do that uh, and make it two books. Happy to happy to share, you know, table space. That would be cool. Oh yeah, you know that's a great idea. I've I've done some events out there before over the years with Zions Bank and with uh, Hill Air Force Base and with uh, Brigham Young University as well. So uh, man, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, well, I, listen, we'll I'm be in down. touch. We'll be talking. So just file that away as something we can do. Uh, and if I can get over, where are you in Alabama? I'm where in Birmingham. Are, how close is that to Maxwell? Probably an hour and a half or two hours. So that's something as a as a place to go. I could do that when I swung through Fort Walton Beach. I was thinking maybe I'd I could maybe go to Maxwell and maximize my time while I was down there. But um it all depends on the schedule and you know, you know how this works. It comes down to my publicist. And yep. I know that uh Grand Central has great hopes for this book. They're they believe it'll be, you know, a, a really powerfully selling and and have a powerful impact uh as a narrative. So I we're still in the formative stages. I don't know what my book tour looks like, but I know it is. I'll be glad when it's over. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will gladly promote how I can, and I'll uh, keep you know I'll keep track of you on social and on your website for when you do have more signings and events coming up. But it's been a pleasure, Dan. Thank you. This has been awesome, and I look forward to following up with you some more. Yeah, no, me too. Dad, I look forward to making your acquaintance in person, and uh, good luck with what you're doing. I think it's just wonderful uh, the way you've gone about this so professionally. And if I can help, you let me know, but uh, I'm sure we'll be talking between now and summer and then some. Absolutely. All right. Cheers, man. <laughs>